The following presentation was made possible by supporters like you. Consider making an impact today by honoring Science for Georgia with a gift or by joining our Catalyzer Network. Thank you and enjoy. Well, welcome to our second of our fireside chat series. Uh, this is a series that gives us more time to talk to some of the presenters from the Environmental Justice and Climate Protection Conference that we had held in June. Um, let me give you a little bit about Science for Georgia. Um, we started in 2018. Um, we came out of the March for Science that was held here in Georgia, Atlanta. Um, we want to basically build a world where science and technology can solve problems, but we can only do that if we make the science like understandable, concise, and actionable. Um, so to do that, we have three mission, parts of our mission. First one, improving communication with scientists among the public. Uh, we uh, have our, or we have, uh, sorry, our uh, SciComm Academy, where we teach scientists how to communicate with the public. Um, we do th events like this with the conference or our Science Junction, which we do monthly to increase public engagement with science, where scientists come out and talk to the public about their science. Uh, and then we go to the Capitol and we make sure that science has a seat at the table. Um, we do white papers and uh, explain to the legislators what they're voting on, like what science says about this, this, those subjects and how that works. Um, so we do this with communication, collaboration, and activating. Uh, we do many things at the SciComm Academy. We do events with the Atlanta Science Festival. Uh, we do roundtables. Uh, where we have people speaking to people in power, legislators, business owners, things of that sort, trying to get change made. Uh, we have the conference where we pull people together. Um, and we just do a lot around. We've worked with getting uh, literacy bills done and a few different other things at the Capitol. And then we write open letters from the science community about uh, events that are going on, like the proposed mining near the Okefenokee Swamp. So today, uh, Dr. Treva Gear is going to be talking with us, um, and I talk it over, headed over to Karen to introduce. Thank you, Patrick. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our virtual fireside chat, a collaboration event hosted by Science for Georgia and Dogwood Alliance. Today, we are gathered to explore the vital topic of environmental justice and climate action from industrial logging. We aim to foster a conversation that raise awareness, inspire action, and create a path towards a healthier and more sustainable future for all. For the last 25 years, Dogwood Alliance has fought threats for our forests and frontline communities. The organization has partnered with communities to develop economic solutions that work with and for the forest. Dogwood Alliance believes in promoting forest protections as the best solution to climate change. With us today, we have Dr. Treva Gear, who is the Georgia State Manager and the founder and chair of the Concerned Citizens of Cook County. In this segment, Dr. Gear will dive in more topics on climate change, community solution, and why protecting our environment is, is important for our health. Please help me give a warm virtual clap by welcoming Dr. Gear. Take it away. All right. Well, good morning. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you all for having this fireside chat so we can finish up on this, uh, this important work that was begun during that climate protection conference. And uh, so I'm going to share my slides now. And so I'm going to just touch on a few things uh, and, and maybe add some additional things. And of course, you know, all of this can't be shared in one day, but I'm just going to give you something to chew on a bit today. All right. Can everybody see my screen? Yes. All right. Great. 
So looking at the intersectionality of environmental justice, climate protection, and, and health, human health, because that's a big piece and it's something that often gets uh, left out of the whole situation. Uh, so I'm going to start by telling you who Dogwood Alliance is. Um, first of all, we're based in Asheville, North Carolina. Um, we spend the loss of our, our, our focus is fighting to protect the forest and front, front line communities from the logging industries that tend to pollute them. We've been doing this for over 20, for about 27 years, and we're really focused on healing our relationship with the land, but looking at the historical uh, injustices in our BIPOC communities in which uh, oftentimes these industries are placed. And so this is a very important conversation that we're having just as, as, as it aligns with the conference. And so the thing about it, we can't make meaningful progress until we get justice for in these communities. Our mission is Dogwood a lot. We, we, we work to advance environmental justice and climate action by mobilizing diverse voices to protect Southern forests and communities. So that is the work that we do. And the thing about it uh, that I like and I want to highlight is that we're not doing this work uh, just and the community, but it's both. It's both and, and not just one or the other. And oftentimes in a lot of environmental justice organizations, what I see sometimes is a loss of focus on the, the earth impact without talking about the people impact. And it's the earth and the people. It's the environment and the people, both and. And we know that our forests are our strength. So uh, just to focus on what a frontline community is, when we start looking at that, we look at the fact that this is an environmental justice community. Environmental justice communities are defined as communities have 25% communities of color, tend to have high poverty, tend to be overburdened by polluting industries. And uh, many of our partners are in North Carolina, South Carolina, Mississippi, Georgia, uh, Alabama, and other places. But well, today I'm going to just focus on kind of on looking, talking about Georgia in a sense. So big picture, as we talk about the intersectionality between environmental justice and climate protection and health, we have to go back to the fact that trees are our, for, our solution for pollution. I'm saying when we, I taught biology for years. And in that time, you know, and even when I think about my schooling, we talked about photosynthesis. And we know that photosynthesis is, a, is an important process for life in general because the trees produce oxygen and they sequester and suck up the carbon dioxide. And that's a good thing, okay? And it's green and that's important. But we also forget the fact that, that trees do a whole lot of other things like filtering our water, uh, prevents flooding, uh, and all these different things. Uh, the, the biodiversity we have here in the South is based on that forest and, and those organisms and those the wildlife having a place to live. Because what we notice is when we start cutting trees down, we start seeing wildlife in places that they wouldn't normally be in. Uh, it's important for canopy cover. And we'll talk a little bit about that, how it keeps us cool. And it overall helps prevent the, the, the whole process of climate change and global warming. But we seem to have forgotten that. So I'm going to highlight some of the things that are going on and some of those intersectionalities between one thing does not happen without it affecting so many other things. So I'll tell you the big problem in our work and so many of the places is, is the green energy lie. And, and, uh, and this is why we do the work that we do with Dogwood is in 2009, the European Commission decided they say that, uh, that burning trees was green. So it's a big green lie. Uh, if you cut down a tree, burn it, and then replace it with another one, then it's carbon neutral. Well, <laughs> we know that the thing about it is that burning biomass for energy emits more than 30 to 50 percent more uh, carbon than coal. And what's happening right now, our southeastern forest is being cut down, turned into wood pellets, and being shipped overseas to Europe to be burned in coal-fired power plants, and they're calling it green. And that's a problem because pollution in one place, and there's a big whole process with the logging process in general of the actual logging of the tree, then the production of the wood pellet plants, of the pellets that end up being in 
our environmental justice communities that are already overburdened, that are already sick, that already have high cases of asthma, and then they're doing that, and then they're taking those trees and then burning them. And we know that the trees are not immediately replaced because uh, it takes years and years to get a full grown tree. We know a mature tree is actually 50 to 100 years old. So I, um, when I talk to individuals about this and folks in the conservation industry who say that, well, this should be an industry, but that actually proclaims that this is good and that trees need a new job. I tell them, I say, well, you're replacing all of these trees and you're saying you're planting so many more, but what we know is that private landowners don't necessarily have to plant their trees again. So that's not necessarily true. But however, it's just like having five adult workers, 10 adult workers. You remove those workers from the environment or something happens, they die. Then they say, well, 10 babies were born. Well, yeah, they were. But the 10 babies cannot do the work of the 10 adult workers. So there's a major gap there. And we know the science, does, it does not line up. So just to highlight that, but pollution in one place cannot be isolated. So we're all going to bear the brunt of this dangerous lie. Let's look at poverty in the US South. This map is a map that we use at Dogwood that we, that, you know, that um, our scientists has developed. And you can see where poverty is in the US South and where it runs in those dark spots. Well, Equally, you can also see that this is where our African-American population is. And then this is where a lot of the biomass plants are. Okay. But what you probably will also find is that is where a whole lot of other polluting industries are located as well. In small rural towns, that have EJ communities and figure they don't have the, the social power, the political power to actually change it. Or even they oftentimes don't know because one thing is sure that in your more affluent communities like in Adel, Georgia, which is my hometown, those industries are not placed in those communities and their property values are higher. And in those situations, and their health tends to be a little bit better than in those in these EJ communities. So what you will find, these are some of the sourcing regions as well. So these are areas where you're cutting trees down. They're usually within a 75 mile radius. So uh, there's there's a lots of impact going on in these communities that go far beyond air pollution as well. Then if we look in these same general areas, these are some of the these uh this orange area is where Logging is causing is the truck cause of lots of tree coverage loss in the U.S. South. And then if we look at the loss of our landscape integrity, it is in the South in these red areas because these industries like Drax and Viva and Fram in the state of Georgia, there are three top um, wood pellet industries in the country. This is where they're logging the trees. So we don't really have old growth forests, but I'm giving you all this information to take us to a final conversation about who, because we're talking about the forest, we're talking about the pellets being, uh, trees being cut down for pellets and sent overseas. We're talking about the pollution involved in all of that, uh, that whole process. And then we get to this, what is the impact? What is the impact on the people? So I'll tell you, the wood pellet industry produces um, produces a lot of different pollutants like formaldehyde, benzene, acrolein, uh, all types of uh, uh, just uh, carbon monoxide, multiple different types of uh, hazardous air pollution, pollutants that are carcinogenic and these things. And then it leads to what's the outcry of the people. So here's just some headlines from some of the papers around uh, about the wood pellet industry in general. Wood pellet mills, the air violations raise concerns of a biomass industry. This goes back to my hometown of Adel, which has been overburdened by polluting industries for years. I'm saying we are what they call a community that 
bears the brunt of legacy pollution with people with high rates of heart disease, asthma, other sickness and illness. And, and also you look around and you see, I always say, look for the smokestacks. On the west side of town, you have all of the industry. You have that place where the air doesn't smell quite right, where the water doesn't smell or taste that quite, quite right. And it's in those environmental justice communities where people tend to be sicker. But I want to highlight in the lower left-hand corner, uh, this is something recent that happened in South Augusta. In our South Augusta community uh, in Georgia, they have some of the poorest air quality and you'll hear Georgia Juan talk about the the radio the radioactive uh, waste and different things that are related there. I think one of the uh, plant volatile is uh, close by, and all of the industry that is there in South Augusta and the illness and the sickness of the people. So recently there was a industry trying to come in that was saying they were a biomass biogas plant that was going to get rid of uh, waste additional waste. So having waste diverted from the landfill, but it was going to be next door to a community that was already overburdened. And so that community is currently fighting and pushing back uh, because they have a lots of members who, lots of individuals in their community who are sick, not just, uh, and it's mainly because of the industries in the, that, are, that are in the community. And it's something for us to stop and think about overall is that how do we get here? Why are we fighting these same fights? Uh, why can't an established community feel safe and not have to worry about the industry next door, the plant that moves in next door to it? That economic progress, because that's what it always comes as economic progress is built on the backs of the people of color, the people who are uh, have, the, have the highest level of poverty, those people. That has to stop. So I bring it to this about the reality is that saving the planet equals saving the people. And you can't do one without the other. If you're going to save people, we're going to protect the health of our community. And oftentimes, environmental health is not discussed. I'm saying, well, health is not discussed with the environment. And people just say, well, you know, we need to save the trees. Okay, yeah, but why? What's the big picture? We need to save the planet. Well, freak, the planet is here for us. The trees are for life. The planet is for life. It's, it's a breathing entity. It, you know, it breathes through the lungs of the trees or the lungs of the earth. And if we don't get that in place, we are going to have a problem which is why we're trying to stop it from stop the earth from increasing by 1.5 degrees, you know, and it's not just going to be electric cars. that does that. It's going to be, it's going to have to take some deliberate, intentional, purposeful action in everything that we do to not pollute and to not harm the people. Cause if you're not harming people, ultimately you're not harming the earth in the long run. If we don't harm people, we won't harm the earth. But we think it's okay to harm certain people and not others. But we're all being hurt either directly or indirectly. And so we're going to look at this chart. And then I'm going to not uh, talk, but we talk about the impact of climate change on human health. And I just have to, uh, we look at a severe weather, air pollution. Uh, I'm going to look at, I'm going to look at the, uh, I'm going to go from the inside out. So you got increasing CO2 levels. You, you, you're degrading the environment. You're degrading, you're causing extreme heat. Uh, rising sea levels, what's that? Flooding. You got more extreme weather. I have to say that we are getting more extreme weather. I'm saying in the, uh, like recently we had that, that hurricane that came through. And it hit through Valdosta, which is where I'm based. And it went through Adel. Eight, uh, eight, which is Cook County, Adel and Valdosta, Adel and Valdosta area with this declared disaster zones in the state of Georgia. And if you look at that, there's a bigger impact because you have the weather. But the thing about it is that if you are an environmental justice community, you bear 
a greater weight and uh, you're more highly impacted. It's more severe for you. Why? Because you don't have the economic means already. You're already sick. You already don't have uh, some basic needs or things. You tend, you might tend to live in poverty. So when your lights go out, you've lost your food. When your lights go out, you may not have, you can't just go pull a generator out. Uh, there's there's the, the consequences are greater. Uh, if you look at flooding, same situation. You know, um, communities of color and those in the high poverty tend to live in low lying areas where there is poor drainage. So they're more, their areas are more likely to flood quicker than other parts of the community. And then you got water sitting around. So then you got more chances of disease. So we have to get this together. And we start looking at the extreme rising temperatures. Those homes sometimes don't have air condition. And when they don't, you, you're more likely to have elderly people who have heat injuries or lose their lives because of the high levels of heat. You have these, what we all call heat islands and things like that in these communities. And like I say, forced migration, civil conflict, mental health impact, it impacts everything. If you don't have the means or the economic means to combat this or to be able to move, and most times people aren't just able to move, they don't have the funds and the environmental justice communities do not. So like I say, they, they bear a greater brunt of the health impact, not just in one generation, for multiple generations. For example, in my hometown of Adel, there's a across the plate, across the field from where the second wood pellet plant is going to be placed, there was an old lumber yard that was filled with creosote and uh, other and arsenic that were used to make the electric poles. And many people got cancer in that location. And that, that was a cleanup site. It was supposed to be cleaned up by the EPA, but um, well, the EPA had demanded, had put out an order for it to be cleaned up, but a cleanup was never completely done. But adjacent to it is a federal housing authority. And that's a problem. And so we start asking our, and th there's people who live there for generations and raise generations of kids. So imagine the long-term impact on that family and in area, and most times these people don't have health insurance. Uh, so the thing about it is we look um, and we wonder why in communities of color, there's more kid cases of asthma, heart disease. It's not that's just because they're just doing bad stuff and just eating bad or just, you know, it's because of the air they breathe and the water they drink and, and, and all of the impacts that come together um, into this nasty little soup of, of illness caused by environmental injustice. Uh, and us thinking that you can hurt one set of people and uh, are allow injustices in one set of in one community and it not hurt all of us is flawed thinking. I think back to Martin Luther King's uh, statement, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I just have to say that because I just visited Memphis last week for the Southern Unity and Racial Justice and Equity Conference uh, by the uh, Progress for Southern, Partnership for Southern Equity. And uh, it was quite striking because I visited the Civil Rights Museum the National Civil Rights Museum. And the sad part is that the fight is the same. This is a human rights fight. This is a civil rights fight. And uh, thinking that you can do something to one group of folks who are considered less enfranchised or we want to consider inferior uh, is a problem. Zoning has to change. We've been redlining for years. The communities are all the same. They, they still follow some of the same zoning. So we're going to see some of the same things happening. So it goes to this, and this is a book that uh, is called The Intersection, The Intersectional Environmentalist. How to dismantle systems of oppression to protect people and the planet. And the big point is that we can't save the planet without uplifting the voices of its people, especially those most often unheard. And it's a conversation. I'm just going to hush for a minute. It is critical 
that if we love the planet, we're going to have to love the people and we're going to have to act like it. So we got to stop letting that industry come across town and ruin that, ruin a certain community's air, ruin the, the most impoverished community's air while we protect the fluent communities. But we're really not protecting anybody when we allow that to happen because air pollution cannot be isolated to one location. It ultimately harms us all. So what I'm gonna ask you to do, if you are able to, is to um, take action to protect some communities today. We have an Enviva action. Uh, what, what we're doing, this is one of the industries that are polluting many of our North Carolina uh, residents. Uh, we have one plant here in Georgia and that industry is located around a bunch of uh, what we call uh, sensitive receptors. Uh, you know, there's a, I think there's a prison around it. There's a, there's a juvenile justice center around it. Probably it's within my, one mile of the community. And the thing about it, just because we don't see the industry doesn't mean it's not hurting us. And so this is an action that you can take today to stand with us in asking them to, to have good neighbor policies. Uh, think about where they're sourcing and how they're sourcing their trees to look at uh, their fugitive dust emissions because there's multiple ways because lots of times uh, environmental justice communities bear the brunt of trucks, uh, lots of truck traffic. Uh, and if there's a uh, trains, even where the trains come and I, I have to, I can't forget this next time you're in an EJ community, like I say, look for the sm smokestacks. If you just drive through, look and see, or if you're looking at night or if you're sitting on the train track waiting for a train to come through, look and see what kind of chemicals are coming through on that train. And they're very dangerous that if, if there was a derailment, it would be, um, there would be a major impact. We've seen this in other EJ communities across the country. I'm saying we've seen things like the Flint, Michigan. I think there was just a recent derailment. I can't remember the name of the city, but it occurred and it took a long time for them to, what they said that the air was okay for a while, but for them to assess the total impact, but that impact on that community is going to probably be long-term. And then five to 10 years from now, we'll read a study saying, this is how this community was impacted. We need to get real about the problem. So please um, take this action. You can go to our website on Dogwood and, and take an take a action at any point. Because of this need for a focus on environmental justice and climate protection and health, Science for Ge Dogwood Alliance, Science for Georgia and Georgia One and Eco Action have joined together to continue the work, which was the plan after the conference to actually start working on an EJ bill or pushing one to join together in a coalition to protect people because it's about pet protecting people, which protects the planet, which protects our environment, which protects our climate. It is all interconnected. Uh, we're all interdependent on each other. It's the circle of life, okay? I'm saying we need to take people back to watch The Lion King then. We might just need people to watch The Lion King. I don't understand. So uh, if you're interested in getting involved, please contact me. I'm Dr. Treva Gear. I'm the Georgia State Manager of Dogwood Alliance. Uh, our work is to protect the trees and protect the people. But I will tell you this, we can't do one without the other. And standing for our planet means standing for the people. Standing for the forest means standing for the faces that sit behind that forest. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to pass it on to uh, Patrick. I guess we're open for questions now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Treva, that was great. Um, so I guess I'll start us off with our first question. Um, so this is just one that like I had for you. Um, when you're with the citizens of or concerned citizens of Cook County, um, and Dogwood, you, you were able to contact Dogwood, and they started helping to with that fight. How did that work for you? How was the collaboration? What kind of benefits did you get? From collaboration. Okay. So how did that work, and what were the benefits? So yeah. the, the big thing was the fact that we were able to, there aren't that many um, environmental organizations at all in the Southern region, point blank period in South Georgia. 
So, you know, getting connected with walls, with the river keepers and saying, hey, who do you know? They connected me with Dogwood Alliance. Dogwood Alliance was able to make sure we had our, we, they were able to preserve our rights and say, hey, there's a there's an air permit coming. Because it had not been, it was in the early phases we were able to find out this plant was coming, which is normally is not usual. We were having, we had convened the meeting of concerned citizens. We weren't the concerned citizens at that point. But I convened the meeting to find out what the issues were. And what they were allowed, able to help us come in on the air permit to know that we had the right to come in on the air permit early on in the early phases. We were able to, at the phase of at the local level of zoning and annexing of the property and zoning at heavy industry for the first plant, because this is the second plant that we, we just recently dealt with with the settlement, but we were able to uh, petition our, our local government. They gave us guidance. They provided information about what type of pollutants and, uh, the, the, and toxins that the plant would emit and things about the noise and all those different things that we would not have ever known and no one would have told us. So it put us in a position to advocate for ourselves and to fight. But without them, we would not have known that there was a fight that needed to be fought. Okay, thank you very much, Treva. Uh, any other questions? I do. Okay. Hi, Dr. Gear. Thank you so much for presenting. Um, this is very close to home. I just finished an environmental health class course and we we're talking about topics like this. So thank you for sharing your knowledge. Um, so one of my question I have, what, well, let me first, we'll start with this. How can local communities in Georgia become more involved in advocating for environmental justice and sustainable climate solutions. Okay. How can they become more involved? I will tell them to connect with any organization they know of. And that's the big problem. I'm saying these uh, communities oftentimes don't have, um, especially in the Southern region, they don't have a, they don't have a science for Georgia. They don't have a Georgia wand. They don't have a hundred miles. They don't have an echo action. Um, it's amazing. I will say, you know, get on the internet, see what you can find. If you have access, connect with some environmental organization. Cause I'll tell you this, usually if one can't help you, they'll tell you who you can connect with possibly, you know, the question needs to be, if you can't help me, who can you connect me with to help me with my issue? Because the thing about it, it's kind of like, it's in a, uh, Environmental advocacy in a community is like in a, um, it's like it's in a black box and you got to have a little code to get into it. And, and it's unfortunate. So lots of oftentimes these communities are fighting in, um, in isolation. They're in silos. They're, yeah, they don't have any outside output because a big part of the fight is gaining visibility and having others fight with you because none of us can fight these fights alone. And so that's the biggest piece, doing outreach. Keep knocking the doors, keep calling the phone, calling the numbers to see who can and will help you. You will eventually find somebody, but that's going to be my biggest advice if you don't know someone. Thank you. Um, my another question that I have for you is how can individual reduce their carbon footprint and support environmental justice effort in their everyday lives. I think that's something I know like when I'm at work or I'm talking to some friends, we ask that kind of question amongst each other. And like, if you have any advice or resources that we can do within our own everyday life. Okay. I can say, I can say do more with less. That's one. Thinking about think about how much paper you use. Uh, that that's simple. Um, that's something I have to manage myself. You know, when you know when uh, when you know better, you do better. And so, just knowing something as simple as that, conserving water. Uh, what type of products you 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 buy? Um, make sure you know you use recyclables and try to recycle where you can. Uh, that's a big problem we have in the South. We don't have. They don't do a lot of recycling. They don't have recycling centers as they should. Uh, and, and that's something that's, that, that needs to be in every, in every city's plan. But we don't, we don't do that. 
uh, like we should. So it's people who want to recycle, sometimes they have the pr a problem trying to find out where to put the stuff, where, you know, how do I do this? Uh, so it can start as simple as that, uh, you know, using, you know, of course, you know, kind of, you know, but those, those are some simple everyday things, conserving your water, plant a tree, try to maintain your green spaces how you can, you know, planting, uh, planting, trees in your yard that will help, you know, will, that will help, you know, add back to the environment are not cutting when you you can. I would say, you know, forest landowners, and th this goes extreme, you know, because it's it's uh it's talking about people who own land, looking at other ways to to uh, benefit from your property and to make money from it using recreation versus clear cutting. Things like that. Getting involved with other organizations who were trying to preserve uh, preserve, uh, prever preserve the earth and doing some work in the community, helping advocate and being mindful of, of industries that are coming in that are polluting. Mm -hmm. That's a big piece because while we're trying to, while we're trying to do our simple things, trying to lower our carbon footprint, you know, manage how we drive or what we drive and all those different things, uh, composting versus burning our trash, things like that, repurposing, uh, you know, mulching our, the, you know, any type of limbs and reusing those things. But while we're trying to do all that, there's bigger impacts occurring at the same time. So, you know, you can definitely sign on to a petition like we're talking about, uh, get involved in the advocacy movement um, in small ways. If you can't do it in big ways, you can sign a petition. You can do some just simple actions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And those are just those are just a few ways. I'm saying that's just the tip of the iceberg. Correct. Correct. Okay. Uh, so do we have any other questions? I do. I have one last question. Oh, sure. Um, so I have a couple, but this one right here. What role can science and technology play in addressing climate change and promoting environmental justice in our state? I'm in the state of Georgia, right now I live in Houston. Uh, yeah, so like what role do you? Well, I will say that the first thing will be to believe the science. Mm -hmm. Science is as it always has been. You know, as I stated about what I taught my students about the trees. And then when we talk about the uh, the geological cycle and the, the biogeochemical cycle and things like that, those things have substance and they don't change. But when we do things that defy them and then call, you know, we got to call a spade a spade. If it's pollution, it's pollution. If it's disrupting the geological geological process, the geochemical process, it's disrupting that process. If Correct. it's causing an excess amount of uh, global warming uh, or what we call the greenhouse effect, which is supposed to be a good thing, but now it went on steroids and now we got global warming, which is resulting in climate change. We need to say that. We have to call out and name the fact that we are experiencing uh, greenwashing that is based in greed. It's more about how we can um, turn trees and turn our resources into a economic engine versus us versus us preserving it, being good to it, being good stewards of our environment. And I think when we start talking about that, it's based on the science and who is truly impacting and what the end game is. Because we have the technology, we have the data, we have everything we need, but it's one thing is believing the data yeah, and acting, letting, letting the data guide us because we're not letting data guide us. We're, we're being guided by green and it's not green and trees, it's green bags. Uh, show me the money. And- <laughs> If you can show me the money, you can poison all those people over there. But then it goes back to, and then this big environmental justice issue is that as long as they, as long as industries, municipalities, um, our state thinks that they're harming one set of people and that it's kind of okay if we just put, you know, cumulative, cumulative impacts and not looking at those cumulative impacts because there's already multiple industries for the dollar we're not going to we're not going to win until mm -hmm. we can look at all those factors stop lying and denying and crying that is economic progress mm -hmm. and then maybe we can win we can have a healthier community and maybe we can save this earth 
And I hope I answered your question. You did. You did. Thank you so much, Dr. Gear. I appreciate it. That's it for my questions. Okay. Um, anyone else? Jesse or Michael? Uh, hmm. I feel like my question might have been uh, already answered, uh, you know, implicitly or explicitly, but uh, obviously um, most, a, a lot of these issues are impacting uh, communities uh, outside of Atlanta and they're really, you know, really bound to, you know, the, the relationships that people have with the com local communities, the local land, um, really location-based issues. But uh, in light of that, um, what are some ways that we, uh, we in Atlanta and other parts of the other parts of the state can still support these causes. Uh, obviously, here in Atlanta, we have the advantage of being close to the state legislature. So, maybe something along those lines. I would say, start to look for opportunities. Well, I'm here. You know, <laughs> sometimes we have. I'm in deep South Georgia. We're about 15 miles north. 15 minutes north of the Florida line. So reaching out for those opportunities, find the organization, because you can find the news, you can find the, the issues, but find, find a gatekeeper like myself and connect to other organizations because I can connect There's you know, because people don't know what they don't know. Sometimes they don't even know that the industry is harming them. I'm saying, I, I was at a, um, at a picnic, it was, a, it was an event of another organization I'm a part of and I looked across the field and there's a senior home, there's an established community. And then there's industry in the backdrop. Like this is the backdrop. And I'm like, this is so wrong. And I said, I bet they don't even know how harmful that industry is to their, to their, to their residents, to themselves. You know, that the breathing issues they may be having and the problems they may be having. So I think we're going to have to reach back and reach down intentionally, just like recently. I had an organization that was at the Environmental Justice Conference reach out to me on the concerned citizens have to say, hey, let's do some work together. That's what it's going to take. And we might have to do a, be a, do a very determined outreach, like saying, hey, Dr. Gear, what other communities down there in the South have some polluting industries that need some information and some education? Uh, you know, and we have organizations like Gipple who are reaching down and we're partnering with organizations like Black Voters Matters and other social justice groups. Because this is the social justice, the social justice, the environmental justice, all that stuff, just health, all that stuff intersects. And we, we're going to have to just expand our arms and maybe do it through some of these organizations who might already be established. So yes, that's I hope that answers your question, but that's just a a, a beginning of what we can do. All right, thank you for that. That was a very positive answer. I liked that. Um, okay, uh, I think for myself, uh, I, the last question I've got, um, so we've had some stuff, especially during the conference, talking about uh, the way Georgia does zoning and how that's caused a lot of these problems, especially with the newer industries coming in. Uh, can you get, talk a little bit about that fight? I'm gonna tell you that's that's gonna that's gonna be major. Uh, I I know I had I was at another summit and I know that Atlanta is looking at doing some. I know they're looking they're looking at doing some rezoning in some different locations and and addressing that. But it is gonna take the local municipality to look at it. But getting their attention may even take is gonna take a higher a longer and a stronger arm. Uh, because you're you're looking at this is what we've done because uh, I'm looking at the industry that's adjacent to that housing authority that is now a brownfield but it needs to be um, rezoned from heavy industry or else another industry will come in and we'll keep fighting the same fights and I don't care how much injustice I don't care how much justice 40 money you pour at a problem that is uh that you're continually can continue to exacerbate based on zoning um 
it's a big it's a big issue. So lots of conversations going to be had at the local level. It's going to be had to have have at the state level, and I think it ties back into that in, that environmental justice work um, and bill because I think once you realize you can't put an industry by this particular community, then maybe you'll be forced to rezone it. So it's it's going to have to come one way or the other because I don't think. It's going to, I don't think some of these places are going to willingly do this without force if they don't have to. Yeah. Like I call it litigation, legislation, or loopholes. One mm -hmm. of the three L's have to happen for people to move. And um, that's sad, but I think that's, <laughs> that's the real, there's no easy well, answer. Yeah, because I mean, you're fighting against the fourth L, which is legacy, which is uh, unfortunately the way people, a lot of people view this stuff. Yes. Because it's been happening for so long. This is the way we've been doing business. Why, you know, this industry has been in this community forever. This has always been such and such. And, and what you see is blight and, I don't know, it all has a, a, a real nasty uh, cycle of what eventually happens, you know. So, because people yeah. can't leave out these communities because they can't sell their property because it's still by heavy industry. And ultimately, it becomes very blighted. The people die off. Then you might get some gentrification maybe but it's only if the industries go away if they change it so mm -hmm. i love to see some fun and to start turning some of these nasty brown fields that are directly beside ej communities into green space this usable liv livable housing now that's a project to, to use some of this um justice 40 and other money money other monies for it should be a demand made on people but people don't i won't say people governments local or state oftentimes don't do things until they're forced to either by the political force of the people or by a stronger longer arm yeah unfortunately hopefully things with some of those grants coming in and even the inflation reduction act money coming in you might see well might, we might see some more green industries coming to some of these places and then that would put financial pressure on some of this and I, and I believe, too, that uh, when we st that's a big piece. I think they need a not this, but that. And that's something I've thought about with the local, like the Cook County Economic, the economic divisions, because these are entities in the community. They're actually attracting industries and then they attract them to certain places. You got your in Georgia the Department of Community Affairs. They help with planning. And they actually fund some of these projects that are actually not good for the community. So there's this, there's a whole bunch, bunch of things going on behind closed doors that environmental justice communities never know about. And, and, and taxpayers are funding their own demise. So you think Department of Community Affairs sounds happy to me. Like, yeah, what? It's Department of Community Affairs are looking for opportunities. Yes, but they also look at planning opportunities for industries to come in. And so we need a plan. And that's this is something for us to talk about with our partners, about what industry can you bring? Who can we attract that's not nasty, that actually will truly provide jobs and actually be green and clean for the environment? And that's what these little rural towns need, because that's what happens. These industries go there because they always need money. You know, if we, you know, so, yeah. Completely question, understandable. Patrick, good question. Thank you. This needs to be a to be continued. <laughs> the, the conversation always is. That's that's the thing. We just we need to keep talking about it. Um, well, uh, if that's the end of questions, yeah. uh, I would say thank you very much, Treva. Thank you for spending time with us and talking about all of this. We really appreciate it. Um, yeah. That we'll have the next one on Friday with Georgia Wand. Uh, and then on the 24th after that with uh, GreenLink Analytics. Uh, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Really appreciate it. I hope you have a great day. Again, Treva, thank you. thank you for sharing your expertise. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. For more information on Science for Georgia's mission and our past work, visit our website at scienceforgeorgia.org.